Um, the next person we've managed to find here at Dragon Meet today is Robin D. Laws, um, who is here uh, obviously with the, the Palgrain Press booth. Um, hi, Robin. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Hey, no problem. Glad to uh, do it. Okay, and um, of course the thing we're mostly going to be focusing on is uh, the Hillfolk Kickstarter, which has just finished. So can you tell us a bit about how that's gone? Um, how far over your expectation did you go? How many sort of stretch goals and so forth did you manage to get on that? Okay, so you can tell where my expectations were because that's where I placed uh, Drama System, the underlying rules engine for Hillfolk, uh, as being uh, becoming open content. And I put that at $12,000. Uh, and we did... Uh, nearly $94,000. Oh, wow. So you could see that there's a discrepancy between those two things. And so when I started out, I had enough uh, stretch goals between that and uh, various print upgrades and uh, what we call series pitches, which are concepts for alternate settings for the game. Uh, I had a, about $15,000 worth uh, and then had to not only move the distance between stretch goals, uh, further apart so that I wouldn't run out of them right away and then start recruiting other people from the long list of folks that I uh, know from uh, the world of adventure gaming and uh, either have collaborated with in the past or wanted to collaborate on this. And so it was a rolling effort of bringing all these people on board and having them uh, suggest their own settings that they wanted to use in Hill Folk. And even by the end of it, like the last couple of days, Mark Reinhagen contacted me out of the blue and had seen the drama system rules and wanted to do something. And so, you know, I fitted him in right away and this would be his first role-playing writing in over a decade oh, wow. uh, and that's just you know the sense of excitement created by the Kickstarter and by the fact that we we're making the rules available to people as soon as they got on board with the Kickstarter you know created this ripple effect where awareness was going out and uh, I was not only approaching people but other people were approaching me as well so it became you know a big fun whirl of you know collaborative effort. I mean, uh, a lot of people obviously will have either backed the Kickstarter or be aware of it, but for those that haven't, can you tell us just a little bit more about Hillfolk in general and, and what's going on with it and what your plans are? Uh, so Hillfolk is a game in which you play uh, Iron Age Raiders in a time where you're sort of in an isolated badlands and then around the borders of that are all of these great empires. And basically it's a fictionalized version of uh, the Levant in the 10th century uh, BCE. And you can fictionalize that as much or as little as you want. It's a group decision uh, as you sort of create your version of the setting. Okay. And uh, the idea is, is that this is a story of epic personal confrontation between a tightly knit group of people. So if you were to envision an HBO show that was set in an imaginary Iron Age, yep. this is what you would uh, wind up with as you play from session to session. Because unlike a lot of story or narrative based games, it's tuned for long term play. Right. And you, know, you see the characters change and deepen in their situation, uh, alter over time, as you would in a season or two of a TV show. Okay. Um, and this uses uh, a rules engine that I call Drama System, and it's all about getting interpersonal conflict uh, right. Because traditionally in role playing games, we've been focused on uh, the procedural side of storytelling in which characters tackle external obstacles and overcome them using their abilities, yep. uh, but we haven't focused on the other half of narrative, which is interpersonal uh, reaction and counter-reaction, which is a building block of, of narrative that we haven't really touched much. And so what this does is it takes the basic structure of how a dramatic scene plays out in a book or a stage play or a TV show or whatever it is, and then just convey that in a very simple way through a, a token economy. Okay. So that if the two of us are having a scene where you're my son in this raider tribe and I'm trying to encourage you to be more of a warrior and you want to be more of a poet, yep. and I come to you with a demand to go out on a raid, and you then, I am the petitioner, I am petitioning you for an emotional reward, I want you to act more like the son I want you to be instead of the yep. person you are. And then you have a choice as the, as the uh, grantor to either grant my petition or to refuse it. And so if you uh, refuse my petition, I get a drama token as a consolation prize for having been turned down. Okay. Uh, on the other side, if you grant my petition, which is difficult for you to grant for emotional reasons, because yeah. you don't want to be the guy I want you to be, you then, if you make a concession and agree to go out on the raid, you then get a drama token uh, because you have uh, gone against what 
you know you wanted in necessarily in that scene. And so as you play, more tokens become available to the players, and yeah. as you gain more tokens, you could then later, if you had two tokens, use those to, to force another player to give in to you at a time that you particularly wanted them to. Okay, so it helps the whole the game kind of escalate and move on and the, the stories become more epic, as you were saying. Right, because typically in role-playing, we're used to thinking of good role-playing as having a single conception of your character and just sticking to it. Yeah. So the classic argument between the paladin and the thief, yeah. the thief says, let's go and stab these guys in the back. The paladin says, no, that is against my credo. Yeah. And then typically, each player would then just dig in and keep reiterating their basic position, and the scene doesn't develop, it doesn't move on. Uh, but in real life, when someone you care about comes to you and asks you to do something you don't want to do, you're pulled in two different directions. And all of the characters in a drama system game are pulled in two directions using what are called their dramatic poles. So Hamlet, for example, is pulled throughout the course of the play between action and contemplation. Mm -hmm. Or Tony Soprano, you know, his big opposition is, is he a family man with a small f or a family man with a capital F? Yeah. And that's how interesting dramatic characters are built. And so the character creation process asks everybody to make sure that they have an interesting character who can pivot between two different sides uh, and also has fraught relationships with all of the other characters. And, be t and that's basically the, the framework that gives you this freeform storytelling style that is the emphasis is on the dramatic over the procedural. Okay, that sounds absolutely fantastic. I, I will definitely have to have a look into that. Um, the other thing we're asking people today, um, and you're in a particular position to answer this, as someone that works both in the kind of the US and the UK, would you say, is there something you could say about sort of the, the differences you see between US and UK, UK kind of gaming scenes or? Well, it's a kind of slightly difficult the, the, the answer, question. The answer used to be, of course, that there was hardly any UK scene at all, that right. there was, you know, there used to be a games workshop, and there were a couple of companies that would kind of come up and, and then go back down. But what I've seen, you know, even just over the course of the five years I've been coming to Dragon Meat, is an incredible growth in the UK scene. So there's a bunch of big, vibrant companies who, you know, if you look around the hall, there's tons of uh, product out on everybody's table because it's kind of grown to become its own you know, hub in the nexus of adventure gaming. And part of that is due to the way the uh, internet revolution and direct sales have changed the economics of being a small press company mm. into being something viable. So I would say that, you know, because, for example, Pelgrane is a UK company, but it's two, you know, driving uh, writers are uh, Canadian and an American, respectively. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of other uh, uh, Brits. There's uh, Gareth Hanrahan is, is Irish, and he's done a lot of stuff for us. So in a way, the growth of the UK scene reflects the fact that adventure gaming has become post-national, mm -hmm. that uh, there is now a, uh, a, a growing world scene, even, as more uh, companies and people and entities come online from Eastern Europe, and you know now there's going to be you know a Russian translation of the Esoterrorists <laughs> Second Edition coming out before Pelgrane's version. And if wow. you told me when I was a kid uh, watching the F original Russian Afghanistan war unfold that I was you know as an adult would be writing the forward to a Russian edition of my role playing game, I would have never thought that possible. Yeah. So I would you know suggest that the growth of the UK scene is a reflection of, of a broader global movement. Thank you very much. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Um, we also just wanted to say a big thank you as well on behalf of EN World for displaying your Ennies uh, on the table here. Um, and uh, yeah, we hope to see you next year at Gen Con winning some more. I, I, I'm down for that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. It was really nice to talk to you. Okay, take care. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Robin. Very nice